Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of the Angry Astronaut uh, bear room that I'm talking to you from here at the moment. Just these uh, three pictures behind me and uh, my equipment, that's pretty much all that's left in here. Going to be leaving South Carolina for good in just a few days. And I have a little bit more information for you about one of my upcoming tour dates, but I'll get to that after the introduction. So we've just witnessed history in the making. India landing on the moon, becoming the, only the fourth country in history to do so. The United States, the Soviet Union, then much later China, and now finally India having accomplished all of this. But India has really set themselves apart as being the first nation in history, the first space power in history to successfully land at the lunar South Pole. And in many ways, it can be argued that what India has done is more important to the future of lunar colonization than what was accomplished during the Apollo missions. Now, that may sound really crazy to you, but there is method to my madness because the Apollo program did not end up the way NASA wanted it to end up. NASA had amazing ambitions for the Apollo program, which included putting astronauts on the moon full time by the late 1970s and perhaps even earlier than that. We're talking about lunar bases, nuclear powered lunar bases and upgraded Saturn V rockets that were more powerful than Starship. So what were all the details to this failed vision, this dream for the future that was never realized? Why did it fail? And what might the future have looked like if NASA had been allowed to succeed? Good afternoon once again. Welcome to the Angry Astronaut. Quick update on my tour on the 3rd of September. Yeah, that's the end of Labor Day. Maybe not the most convenient time for everyone, but that is the date that I'm going to be in Pittsburgh, and I'm going to be at the Moonshot Museum, which is in the same building as Astrobotic. It's an amazing spot for people who are into spaceflight because both the Griffin Lander and the Peregrine Lander are currently on display there right now preparing for their journeys to the moon and uh, the cost of admission well the cost of the ticket has increased slightly as a result of this it's going to be $15 ahead instead of $10 ahead if you want to come to this event but all of that is going to include a tour of this museum including, by the way, some of it being handled by me. I'm going to try to get some training as a volunteer for this museum so that I can help them out with the presentation. All of that will be included in the ticket. And then after you've had a chance to visit the museum, we'll be making our way to a local establishment, either an eating or drinking establishment, getting all that tied up right now, where we will have my lecture, my presentation on how Starship will save the world. So it's an afternoon and early evening evening dedicated to space flight with the angry astronaut so $15 ahead that's if you purchase it ahead of time if you're paying at the door it will be $20 that includes admission to the museum um, incidentally the normal price for admission to the museum is $10 alone just for that ticket however they're giving us a discounted price and also I'm picking up a bit of the cost for you guys as well so once again $15 if you purchase it ahead of time or $20 at the door or either through my GoFundMe page, through PayPal, just make sure to send me an email confirming that that is what the donation is for. And of course, that includes a digital copy of my book as well. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on to the glorious failure that was Apollo.
I think it's safe to say that all of us have seen at least some of this sequence of images that led up to the liftoff of Apollo 11. Such a stunning success for human spaceflight, a success that really hasn't been matched since. And this is precisely why Apollo ended up being such a failure in the end. In spite of all the amazing accomplishments, in spite of everything that it took to put human beings on the surface of the moon, and then returning them safely, in the end, it was all for naught. It can be argued that no organization on Earth accomplished as much as NASA in the 1960s. In less than a decade, the U.S. space program built a human-rated interplanetary space system from scratch and landed on the surface of another world. Although the great Alexei Leonov often said that the USSR might have won the space race if their brilliant leader Sergei Korolev had not died before his time in 1966, the U.S. definitely left their arrivals in the dust on July 20th, 1969. From a purely scientific perspective, the Apollo landings yielded a treasure trove of results. We learned about the composition, age, and internal structure of our natural satellite. The six missions that actually landed on the moon brought back over a third of a metric ton of samples, which remain useful to this day. No unmanned sample return mission could ever hope to deliver so much material. We also learned about potential hazards to future manned missions, such as the damaging and annoying qualities of lunar dust. But, as far as establishing a permanent presence on our natural satellite is concerned, as far as laying the groundwork for a cislunar infrastructure and a lucrative space industry, we might as well have faked the whole thing on a soundstage. Ten years later, our new human-rated spaceship, the Space Shuttle, could reach low Earth orbit and no further. Although the Soviets maintained a near-constant presence in space on a series of highly successful Salyut stations, NASA could only put humans in orbit for a couple weeks at a time. And the remarkable success of unmanned missions like Voyager owed far more to the 1972 Pioneer 10 mission than Apollo. Had things gone to plan, NASA would not have been mucking about in LEO in the 1970s and 80s. In 1968, NASA had over half a million employees and contractors working for them. One of these employees was my uncle George Nevin, who spent most of his professional career at Cape Canaveral. Uncle George was a huge inspiration to me. In the early 1980s, we would brainstorm about using Russian heavy lift rockets to spearhead a return to the moon because we no longer had that capability. But in 1969, NASA was laser focused on taking moon missions to the next level. A 130 page outline was submitted to President Nixon detailing our plans to establish a permanent presence in orbit and on the moon with a long-term goal of sending humans to Mars. The plan included a long-term lunar habitat called LISA, or the Lunar Exploration System for Apollo. This habitat was designed to sustain six astronauts on the lunar surface for up to six months. A new lunar landing vehicle, or LLV, capable of delivering up to 13.4 metric tons to the lunar surface would deploy the LISA. It included an LRV, or lunar roving vehicle, that could provide up to 3,000 miles, or 4,828 kilometers of travel to the astronauts, plus a 10 kilowatt nuclear reactor reactor and the equipment needed to pile a half meter of lunar dirt on the habitat for radiation shielding. The first version of LISA, called the Base Model 2, would require eight Saturn V launches to sustain 72 person months per year on the moon, whereas the much larger LISA Base Model 4 would require 18 Saturn V launches to sustain 216 person months on the moon. In other words, NASA was planning, by the early 1980s, to put the equivalent of 18 astronauts on the moon year round. By way of comparison, we're lucky to put four astronauts in low Earth orbit year-round on the ISS. 
And to deliver all of this additional payload, NASA had plans for an upgrade in Saturn V rocket, also known as the ELV or Extended Launch Vehicle, with five F-1 engines, plus four strap-on solid rocket boosters similar to the UA-1207 solid rocket boosters that are used on the Titan rocket. The planned super rocket would be capable of delivering 85 metric tons of payload to translunar injection orbit, far more mass than the planned SLS Block II. Adding these four solid rocket boosters would increase the performance of Saturn V by 88%, delivering a total thrust of 14.1 million pounds, or just shy of what Starship theoretically can do, and far more than any SLS rocket that we currently have on the books. But this wasn't the limit of NASA's ambitions. In addition to that, they also had the Nova rocket in planning, and this was a rocket that had eight F-1 engines instead of just five, with the theoretical capability of adding two more F-1 engines, delivering 15 million pounds of thrust, if not a little bit more. Indeed, the Nova rockets were ultimately planned to deliver up to 20 million pounds of thrust, or substantially more than Starship will ever be able to deliver. It was unreal the amount of ambition that NASA had in those days. But of course, they had triple the funding that they currently have and a virtual monopoly on brain power. If you want to get a rundown on what Nova was theoretically capable of, the first stage again with those eight F1 engines with a total thrust of 13.9 million pounds, then a second stage with eight J2 engines with a thrust of nearly 2 million pounds, and then a third stage with one J2 engine with a thrust of 200 132,000 pounds with the capability of delivering 300 metric tons to low Earth orbit. This heavier rocket would facilitate the construction and resupply of larger lunar bases powered by 100 kilowatt nuclear reactors. These bases would be fledgling moon colonies complete with hydroponic algae farms, sewage treatment, housing and command structures, cryogenic storage, launch pads, and even a telescope. Apollo was supposed to kickstart a massive presence in orbit and on the moon. Had Nixon decided to go forward with NASA's ambitions, the U.S. would have become an interplanetary superpower, completely eclipsing the Soviet Union long before the Berlin Wall fell. Thousands, if not millions, would be living and working in space by now, tapping the near-infinite resources of the moon and asteroids to feed a thriving civilization, and they'd be getting rich in the process. Building such an ambitious future would, of course, have required many billions of dollars. Nixon was loath to make this investment and instead spent billions dropping millions of tons of bombs on Laos and Cambodia. Today, the U.S. is still investing $4.9 million a year, disposing of unexploded cluster munitions in Laos. At the same time, Joe Biden is spending billions more delivering cluster munitions to the Ukrainian military, 3% of which will fail to detonate and kill innocent civilians in later years. NASA clearly did a terrible job of marketing their future vision if the government decided that dropping cluster bombs was somehow a better use of our money and resources. Even worse, Nixon decided to end our moon ambitions and opted for a reusable space plane that could only operate in low Earth orbit. Today, a half century later, NASA maintains four astronauts year-round on the ISS, as I said before, a destination 0.1% as far away as the moon. But it gets even worse than that. NASA not only lost the moon back then, they lost Mars as well. NASA also had ambitions of an upgraded Saturn V rocket with a third stage powered by nuclear thermal propulsion, the same propulsion that NASA is working so hard on right now. It was a technology that NASA had at their disposal through the NERVA program way back then. And with the increased performance of a NERVA engine, that is to say about a quarter of a million pounds of thrust with an ISP 
ISP of eight to 900 seconds, or more than double the ISP of the best engines of the time, and indeed even double the capability of the Raptor engines today, they would have had the capability of delivering astronauts to Mars orbit in as little as 90 days. And by the way, they had plans of doing that by 1978. Nuclear-powered moon colonies, super rockets at least as powerful as Starship, nuclear rockets capable of allowing us to traverse the vast distances between the planets. All of these things were in this report in 1969 when they were delivered to President Nixon. All he would have had to have done is given the thumbs up on that and the future would have changed forever. But instead, like so many other people, not only of that time, but also of this time, he simply lacked the vision and NASA was unable to educate him as to why it was so important. NASA's ambitions together with its budget have clearly taken a nosedive since then. Although putting humans on the moon and building an interplanetary transportation system in less Less than a decade was an astonishing accomplishment, NASA achieved very few of its most important objectives with the Apollo program. It was a glorious failure. And so today, over a half century later, all we can do is hope that NASA and those who support them can educate the public and educate the policymakers as to why it's so important that we not fail again. Harvesting the resources of outer space, the moon especially, but also the asteroids, and even planets as far away as Mars is absolutely critical to the long-term survival of our species. Our civilization is doomed if we remain trapped on this planet. That is the theme of my book, which you've heard some excerpts from, by the way, in this particular video. I hope you've enjoyed all of it. Please like, please subscribe, please consider supporting this channel. Keep your eyes and ears open for upcoming tour dates, and as always, stay angry about space.